Today, we're gonna focus on building out a repeatable pipeline. We just got back from a very exciting and insightful GDC. So we went to the Game Developers Conference and saw a lot of folks there, heard a lot of cool stories about how people are using Invoke, but also, you know, heard some of the things that people want to do and want to kind of build a repeatable process for. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through two kind of main primary use cases that we often hear about. We're going to do that today. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to share my screen. We'll get started. So what I did is I made a template, right? I made just a turnaround template. We take a look at our screen here. You can see it's just a depth map of a silhouette. Now, a lot of people have played around with this and done things like open pose skeletons with a turnaround. You definitely can do that. You can actually combine it with this if you want to. The reason why I've done a more of like a 3D blockout turnaround or like a low poly turnaround is primarily because you can control the silhouette of the character. And so, you know, thinking about this as a pipeline, you may have characters that have very specific silhouettes, right? Let's say, for example, you're a live ops game and you've got a character that has a very like notable silhouette and all of the things that you're going to do from a skin perspective are still going to like match to that silhouette. You probably want to create a template for that and allow the AI to get some variation on that, but really kind of stick to the core kind of rig that it's going to be uh, based off of. That's one reason to use a depth map is just to get a little bit more control over the general shape. So we'll start with that and we'll pull that into our canvas here. When you've got a template like this, you can either use the depth control or the Union Pro multi-guidance detection. I'm going to bring this down early on in the denoising process so that it's controlling that early generation. It's giving it structure, but it's not constraining the details as that goes through the remaining end of that pipeline, right? We can play around with the weight here and see if we need to turn that up or down, but I'm going to leave that there for now. And then we're going to maybe do prompt template. I'll do 3D character. We'll give it a shot. We'll see what we get. We've got our character turnaround. It's like loosely fitting to that mesh, right? But it's got enough freedom to do things like add watches and bracelets and stuff like that. This is where you can have some fun. If you're gonna do this, one of the key elements that you want is that you wanna be able to make changes. So let's do this, let's accept it. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say long blonde hair ponytail. And we're gonna do in painting. And I'm gonna in paint the top portion of this over here, but I'm also gonna make sure that I choose the head on each of these regions as well. And I'm gonna try this without doing anything to it, but turning up the uh, denoising strength pretty high. So the reason that I picked each of those three is that I wanted it to do that change on all three views at the same time. We've obviously got like a little bit that didn't come down over here on the right hand side. And that's something that we can kind of like tweak and poke around with. We can draw that in to make that, you know, a little bit clearer, but you can see how you're making changes to all three views as you are going. You don't want to do one at a time because if you do one at a time, you're doing an individual denoising and it's got its own context and it's not really sharing that with the other views. You, you kind of want to do them all together. Once you've got the general rough strokes of this, that's when you can begin, you know, coming in and saying like, let's detail this one out and we'll do, you know, in painting here and we'll do that at a much lower just to get a higher quality finish. You can just kind of like go over that and get some of those details out. So we've got our before and after, before and after. Didn't make it that big of a change. Let's see if we do a little bit more, if, if we like it better before and after. Now, the thing here that we're going to have to be mindful of is, you know, we've made some changes here to the character, right? So his, his looks are a little bit different. And this is where, again, doing things like using control nets can help you drive consistency. So this guy, if we came over here and did that same exercise on this guy's face, let's see if we end up with somebody that looks the same. It's, he looks like a bro. I'm going to go back though, and I'm going to show you how we can keep this a little closer to what we had generated originally. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the pull box, pull B box into layer button. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a little snip here and it's going to make that my control. And because I've got the multi guidance 
model selected, I can kind of flex between these different use cases without having to change the model, which I like. What this is going to allow me to do is I can keep this a lot more close to this original generation while still getting a significant amount of detail added at this smaller level, right? Might need to turn it up a little bit and see what happens there if we want to really keep it on the rails. Let's do the before and after, before, after, before, after. There's still a slight color difference in the eyes, but I think we'll be okay with that. But you can see how we're like very specifically actually keeping a lot of these minute details very aligned with the original and using the control net to do that. I think I'm going to undo a couple of things here because I'm going to show you one more technique that you can do that is kind of cool. Okay, so we're back to our depth map control. I'm going to clear out our in paint mask and I'm going to go back to our full bounding box. I'm going to delete our Hawaiian shirt dudes. I have some boots that I want this character to wear. These are rain boots. I'm not going to prompt for these. I'm just going to regionally reference them and we're going to use the style and composition mode. So the full thing and I'm going to just paint over where I want these boots and we're gonna go. We now have yellow boots. Sometimes you can get some yellow in other places too if it thinks it's needed to give him like yellow bracers, but now he's got yellow boots. So that's super cool, right? Like there's like a lot of power there where you can inject stuff into the turnaround, but this becomes a really cool way to control different segments. You can get into some really interesting pipelines when you build templates around this and section those in a planned way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna generate one more of these to the gallery so we can take this into the workflows and I'll show you what that might look like when we go into the workflow and turn this into a template. Okay, we're going to templatize this. We're gonna make this a template where we can put any picture in the boot, right? We're gonna turn this into like a boot control, <laughs> a boot control mode. So we're gonna load that workflow we're in the workflow editor. We're going to edit it. And we now have all of the stuff that went into that image broken out. You can see this is our boot mask over here. This is like the boots section. We don't want to necessarily edit that, but we do want, you know, boots image. And we'll pull that out into our form and I'll go in and kind of like tweak some stuff. We've got our depth control net. We may want to turn this into a string join because you'll recall we had a prompt template that we had in here, which was this game prompt. I'm going to take all that game prompt stuff and I'm going to put that in the hidden prompt zone. And then we're going to take our actual like user prompt and put that up on the top and we'll drag the user prompt out to the form as well. Probably let them select the model. We'll take this new string and put that in the prompt and put that in the style. We'll leave the negative prompt alone. We'll make this a random seed so that you always get a different image. Just delete this metadata. And I think that is all we really need to do. We can kind of like go in and make anything else that we want to visible, but we'll like do that for now. And then we'll just call this our, you know, boot character turnaround. Now, obviously, if we had more regions in the masking area, we could do a pants selector, we can do a shirt selector, we can do head. All of that can be very, very good. I'll also change our, maybe our prompt here, a spiky hair, a man wearing a leather jacket, suit, pants. Someone gave me some lightning boots. We got these like lightning boots. I don't know how these are going to work out because there's like one pair of boots, but we'll see. Let's give it a go. Turned everything into this kind of like black leather. Let's maybe turn up the strength on this. I think these shoes might be too hard for it. So I think it's going to be inspired by, but not controlled by that lightning bolt. Let's try prompting for this lightning bolt shoes. Turning up that strength that does not like that too much. I'm not getting any of that red in. Let's use a mask here. So I'm going to do another positive prompt. Just going to see if maybe we can get this to be red lightning bolt shoes. Let's do this. So what I'm doing now is I'm adding a string primitive. We're going to call this my boot style. And I am going to see if I can just make it happen. I'm really trying here. 
we're going to take this mask and put the mask on the prompt. So it's only prompting for that in that zone as well. We'll need to connect our other stuff over here as well. And then we're going to take that conditioning and put that in our positive conditioning and give that a shot. Bring the weight back down here for the IP adapter and we'll see if we get it. If we don't, I'm just going to say, say la vie, no, no red lightning bolt shoes getting too much of the um, black leather out of it, but it's not getting that red lightning bolt. In this case, we're not getting that there. We're gonna talk about another fun topic that came up quite a bit, which was 2.5D, 2D asset pipelines. Like how do we really standardize a pipeline for a certain job to be done? There are a lot of cool ways to do it. I'm gonna show you what you have to do in order to get the results that you want. We're gonna to move to the tiles section first. I'm going to kind of show you what we're doing. We're building like hexagon tiles that have a little bit of an isometric look. What I'm going to show you is this is how you build a pipeline for real, for real. Like we've got this initial base template. We want to kind of like use this to inspire our tiles. I'm going to drag this out. I've got this noised layer that I pre-baked. So we use that same technique where we add noise to the layer. What I did was I created this using like an existing tile. I painted white over it. I selected the object, pulled that out as a new layer, and then noised that layer, right? I applied it and then just did the noise on that. So that's how I made that transparent noised layer. So I'm gonna drag that in, I'm gonna line it up, and then I'm gonna drag in a depth map that I made on that very same layer. I'm gonna convert this to a, I brought it in as a raster and I should have done that as a control. I will do multi-guidance. And what I can do is I can clean this up. I'm going to click and then I'm going to shift click over here. Oh, don't take too much off. And lining it up perfectly. I'm going to turn transparency back on. We've got a decent template and we would expect this to work. And so we're going to do, I've got a tile prompt template, right? And we'll do isometric tile hexagon and we'll do something like, you know, a forest. We'll turn this down. We'll bring it closer early on. We want to have a lot of flexibility, but we want it to have the kind of the original kind of the core structure similar to our turnaround depth map. And let's give it a go. We need to turn this up to like 0.98 or so. I'm, I'm anticipating it not working. If it does work, my story kind of gets a little busted, but that's not too bad. I like works okay right? It's not the best tile in the world. Maybe we'll go up even a little bit more and see if we can get just like get away a little bit more from that. It's not great. You're like, okay, well, I don't really love it. Let's try like, you know, painterly concepts, hand painted, crafted with love and care, you know, whatever that is, it's still going to be not quite perfect. Actually, this is pretty good. It's a decent tile, but what we want is we want consistency in our tile. And we want maybe a certain level of depth. Now I'm going to share a little bit of what I did. I did it like in an hour. I trained Allura on the exact tile kind of style and depth that I wanted, right? And to give you a little sneak peek of what that data set looked like, these are the tiles I crafted. I did some in painting. There's not perfect consistency in all of these, but you get the idea of what I'm going for. I'm kind of trying to get a certain depth. I provided some variety in styles, right? So that I'm kind of training it on a little bit more of a varied style palette, as well as a varied subject matter, because I want this to be a flexible tool. And that Laura I'm going to add now is this one, one, one. I'm going to bring that down to maybe, you know, 50%. It doesn't need to be like perfect. All it's doing is helping it align on this kind of like general depth. And then I'm going to use my tile prompt template, which I did not do one, 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 but it has the trigger word in it, which I trained, which was tile style. Tile style is the name that I consistently tagged all of these with. Now with this, we're going to see what we get. We'll do forest should be more aligned with the kind of like style and aesthetic that I trained in to the Laura, right? So now we've got that consistent style and that consistent effect. Let's try something that wasn't in the training set. A Panda Fortress 2.5D isometric, and we'll give that a go. Oh, look at that. Got a little panda. It's there surrounded by rocks as Panda Fortress is the mountains. 
if we do like a panda themed castle fortress, I see little pandas. And obviously if we wanted to, we can fix that. I'm gonna show you a cool trick with uh, one of the workflows that's available online. We're gonna send this to the gallery and then we're gonna build the pipeline around it. So we've got this pipeline, it's working for us. We think it works okay. We're going to our workflow, we're loading that up. We're gonna start from something that we did on the canvas is just a good place to begin. We're gonna collect all of our nodes here and kind of get them in order. We've got the image to latent node happening here. So it's making the tile for us, the control nuts happening and doing all of that. You know, we can expose these controls if we want, and we probably will. The first thing that we're gonna do, do we want our users to be able to customize the LoRa? Probably not, because this is like a tile workflow. So we're gonna leave that there, but we might wanna give them tile style string. We're gonna bring that out and we're gonna let them mess with that. And we're gonna say the emphasis on the tile style. I'm going to change this, the settings on this, to a slider and a number input, and I'm gonna put a constraint on this. I'm gonna say you can do between 0.3 and maybe 0.9 because I don't want the user to go all the way to one because it'll be too strong. So I'm giving them kind of like a range here, but you can control that with a shift and make that kind of like a tiny little UI. I'm gonna turn the description off because we don't really need to give much of a description there. And what I'm gonna do to this one, actually this time, I'm gonna do string join three because what we want the user prompt to be is the middle. Right, so we're gonna do tile style input, and that's gonna be this piece right here. And I'm gonna include a comma and a space after that. The user prompt will be exposed to the user. And then the end of this will be 2.5D isometric. Call that the final sauce. We're gonna bring those in, bring those in. And now we have a little bit of a pipeline here. I could expose this if I wanted to, yeah, maybe I'll do that too. I'll put this in here and I'll create a little container for these sliders. Uh, control weight and tile style. Uh, and this one will be a slider. Maybe we'll do both. And I'll do a minimum of zero and a maximum of one. And we will let it just do its thing there. And now we've got a little tile builder, right? And so we'll try this and we'll say a fire magma lava, a mobile game style, illustrative, and we'll give it a go and see what we get. One thing I forgot to do, as you can tell, we forgot to randomize our image. So we got the same noise every time. Random integer, boom. We're going to turn up our control weight a little bit. There we go. So now all we need to do is just figure out how to prompt for this so that we get what we want, right? So we say like volcano, magma, upweight the volcano piece, beautiful. Kind of cool. We probably make, need to make some tweaks, but you get the idea. We're now making tiles. We're on tile mode and now we're just generating tiles and each of these can be edited in the canvas and tweaked. And maybe one thing we might wanna do, we'll add some negative stuff here. We'll say like flat white background. See if that gives us a little bit more oomph of what we're going for. There we go. Let's try seeing what happens if we turn down our tile style strength and then turn up our tile style strength. Just to see like where that's coming from because it could be that it picked up some stuff. This is the lower one. Okay, we like it at high strength. Let's say rocky, mountain, brown, dirt, and rubble. Maybe I could expose the negative prompt as well kind of build the same input there just so I can kind of like do negative stuff like grass. And so pairing this with the canvas and getting the kind of tweaks and edits that you want is going to be where you get a lot of cool stuff. When this video goes live, so all those people who are watching on YouTube, they are going to have a link in the description, in the notes below to the workflow library on our website, which will have a tile workflow and a link to download the tile Laura that I have trained here, but just as an example, so you can play around with what we did today, this exact workflow, this exact tool that we just built here today in your own Invoke Studio. Hopefully you find it useful. It was fun to do this session today. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.